Steve, welcome to the Way of Champions. Appreciate you being on here today. Uh, it's great, John. Thank you so much, man. Um, I'm excited. Uh, you have such an interesting and diverse background in uh, academics and high performance and what you've done in both sports and out of sports. And I think we have so much ground uh, to cover here today. But I want to start with, I, I think, something that a lot of people who get into coaching or get into physical therapy or whatever is sometimes is like, well, the sport thing didn't work out. That was it for me. Like I, I was like, you know, I got hurt. I had to stop playing at about 26 and well, how do I stay around the locker room? I guess I'll just go coach. So talk about mm -hmm. how you got into this field. Uh, it's, there's probably a couple of different influences and uh, things that experiences I had that led to this. A lot of times for a lot of physical therapists, there's this uh, common thread of maybe a, a bad injury or a, a really great experience going through the rehab process that drove them towards sports medicine. Uh, I didn't really necessarily have that in my story. I, I did have problems uh, as a player uh, in high school and through college, and, and I, that probably gave me some appreciation for what an athlete or individual has to cope with when they're when they're going through the rehabilitation process but a lot of it for me came from at a really young age my parents just telling me i was super intrigued by movement uh is was i think the way i would translate it now and the first time you know the first story my parents tell me was in and around the 84 olympics which uh, was the first Olympics I was really old enough to understand and be and and follow uh, in a in a fanatical way. Mm -hmm. you know, Carl Lewis in track and field at the time was intriguing to me. Mary Lou Retton was mm -hmm. was winning gold. Uh, my parents told me I was glued to the TV when the men's volleyball team would play U.S. men's volleyball team, and mm -hmm. Karch Karai was on that team, and that was mm -hmm. that era. Uh, of of men's volleyball and that seems to be more my story it was more in and around just the appreciation for human potential mm -hmm. and just being fairly you know, in awe of of the things the human body could do and i think that was a big part of it you combine that with just a natural uh interest in in physics and in the in the complexity of human physiology. And, and, in, and in the end, uh, this, this route was, was well, I was well suited to go into this field, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the 84 Olympics. We had a guy on the podcast a couple weeks back, Mark Johnson, who mm. uh, wrote a book called spitting in the soup about the history of doping. And we talked a lot about the 84 Olympics really mm -hmm. being this watershed moment when, you know, doping, you know, when it was sort of the geopolitics of sport, right? Ronald Reagan sat down with the head of the USOC and said, we better win, right? And and the Eastern <laughs> Europeans at that time were way ahead, I think, in the sport performance side of things uh, in mm -hmm. maximizing athlete potential. And the US was sort of like, well, we'll just kind of show up and hope for the best and sort of right. like your field of high performance, I, I think can trace back to right around that time in the Western world where it was like, oh, there's a whole other side besides just getting on the volleyball court or the soccer field in terms of athlete performance. I would agree with that. You know, early on as, as we, as younger practitioners in that era, were looking for guidance in and around the way in which periodization is handled. A lot of the authors we were really keyed in on were Russian. You know, mm -hmm. there was a very Eastern Bloc influence into what we understand now into periodization and the early understanding of supercompensation and how that you know can can benefit us as we undulate between overloads and periods of recovery mm -hmm. what that looks like over a short cycle long cycle all those things were uh, you know some results of what came out of Russia at the time probably research that wouldn't be ethically legal in the United States right, anyway exactly, even if we tried exactly. to even if we tried to conduct it but you know there there is a there is a um, a lot that we learned, unfortunately, out of a fairly unethical period, but the, the, we gathered information out of that Eastern Bloc as we started to move towards, mm -hmm. you know, the early 90s and into what we now see as a, you know, a, 
a very innovative and, and exciting period in sports science as it relates to the, not just how it applies to sport, but now what we're seeing in the understanding of how to create high performing environments. You know, what does that mm -hmm. look like as you exit the sporting arena and start looking at the corporate spaces or even the performing arts? You know, it's very interesting to see how those uh, early days in in those periods where science was being very, very experimental really started to contribute to what we know, not only about, you know, the way to get the human body to excel, but also to get organizationally uh, to get a group of individuals aligned around how to how to achieve. So I think that's, you know, you can take the route through what we see in cycling and and how that's all influenced the overall understanding of team sports, too. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, once you get to the point where we are now, you're starting to see a common thread between what really defines high performing organizations. Yeah. And we'll get into sort of unpacking that um, definition. I want to just kind of touch base on your path before we get there. So sure. you're the performance director or fitness coach for the Columbus crew. And then you head over to Everton in the UK as well. So talk about that difference. Like uh, again, a different time at in MLS soccer versus how we look at it today. And, um, and then going to the English premier league, um, Talk about those two different scenarios. Yeah, the league was in such a different place than it was when I came back in 2014. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the there was, you know, infancy is probably the great way to describe all kinds of aspects of what I was dealing with at the time. Sports science was in its infancy mm -hmm. in MLS. The league itself was in a period of infancy as it relates to the product on the field, the competitiveness of the environments that we were able to create, the, the stadiums facilities. we were playing in. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Uh, there, it's night and day compared to what exists now. Uh, you know, we're looking at world-class facilities being built for MLS teams here in the United States now. And uh, so it was it was a huge uh, dichotomy. Um, you know, the, the difference between what I experienced uh, in MLS and then was able to experience uh, with, in, in my first year in the Premier League was, yeah, I, I was, my hair was on fire for sure. As soon as mm -hmm. I, I got into that environment, but uh, I think the, um, what it did give me this understanding of how to be lean in, in accomplishing goals and tasks, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There, there's one thing to have resources and there's another thing to have so many that you can almost make excuses for being wasteful. And we we weren't able to be wasteful mm -hmm. in our early days uh, in the league. We had to be very, very creative in how we, uh, in a player-centric way, created elite standards without elite resources. You know, I think that was a skill And you had to like justify learned. your existence as well. Like, why am I paying for this? You know? Yeah. Absolutely, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. And then you're beg borrowing and stealing, and then uh, you know you're you're trying to create uh, a platform for players to feel like everybody's doing everything possible for me to excel. And then um, because because of the infancy of it, I think because of the uh, the the low profile nature of MLS on a global stage, there's just less pressure. You know, there. I, would, I don't want to say that pressure didn't exist because that's absolutely not true. It's still a results oriented business. And there was periods at the end of 2007, my first year where we, you know, we didn't make the playoffs in Columbus and there was some pressure and uncertainty on whether I'd be back for 2008. And that's something that, you know, you just have sure. to deal with. But as you start to get into the, you know, the, to seeing and being a part of a league where every aspect of the country's ups and downs is tied to sport. I've yeah. never experienced that before. Uh, yeah. Communities um, that, that really ebb and flow with how this organization at the heart of their city uh, executes from one weekend to the next was something I'd never seen or experienced yeah. ever. It was really eye opening. It made every decision more critical uh, it made the it made us really think about at least I should speak for myself. It made me really feel like I needed to know 
a much better, cleaner, predictable process on how I made decisions because yeah. I had to try to get as close to being right the first time every time as I could. Right. When it came right. to making decisions. And that's something you learn over time. Yeah. And maybe the scrutiny is not as bad as it is today, but because today, like every time a player in that league pulls a hamstring, they're going after the performance director, right? What's the load? What's this? What's that? Right. And it's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah. you know, probably in, you know, 2010, not quite as bad, but it's, but it's still like a really, um, and like you said, the whole community cares The you, you know, you can't walk into the bakery and, and they go, you know, how come so-and-so is hurt? What'd you do to him? You know? And so it's such a crazy environment. But when, so when you think about, you know, a lot of players go from the MLS and they go to Europe and they talk about the difference in environment, the competitiveness for spots uh, to get in the team, um, you know, and then obviously promotion and relegation. Every game is just so intense and matters. Mm -hmm. And then the yeah. community scrutiny, that's a different type of high performance environment than we have in major league soccer for sure. Isn't it? Yeah. It, I think there's, you, you, you touch on another unique aspect of the difference between the two environments. And, and when I, you know, I was at a club at Everton where our, our resources were thin, you know, as, mm -hmm. as it related to how we uh, acquired talent on the, on the player side. And we did compete at a really high level, but we knew that the margins between winning and losing were just smaller. Uh, yeah. Keeping a, keeping a team healthy was really, really important for us. Yeah. And we had periods I've, I've, I've been in that club when we were in fifth place. I've been in that club when we were in second place in yeah. the league. I've been at that club when we were in 18th place. Yeah. So the, the, and that's just the nature of, of the time that I was at Everton. So I've, I've definitely, uh, you know, I needed, I didn't, you don't, you never know what it feels like until you're in it. And I, I'll be fair that I didn't, I probably told myself I knew what that pressure would feel like to be in a relegation mm -hmm. area. And I didn't know what it was going to be like yeah. uh, I, when we were in that spot, there was, there was real doubt and everything was questioned and, and you're, you're, it's a tipping point in those circumstances. And the group can tip towards despair or the group can tip towards hope and it's leadership in that moment that becomes so critical. And, yeah, uh, you know, David Moyes knew how to lead a group out of a period like that. And he always did, man. He yeah. always did. No matter where we were, my five years there, we never finished worse than eighth place, but there was a year where I, we were dead last at one point in my second season there. And Albeit, you know, we finished we finished his seventh or eighth that year. So he credit to leadership in those moments, but it was a different pressure. You just don't feel that kind of stuff when well, when you're in the league early let's, days. Let's talk sure. about Moyes because obviously he's doing it pretty well with West Ham right now mm -hmm. as well. And but probably known best for the the period at Manchester United that didn't work out. And mm -hmm. um, you know what's really interesting? I've had you know a couple of different Manchester United players on this podcast talk about leaving man united and you know, they grew up there they went they, they were in the the academy there they grew up at the cliff or carrington and and mm -hmm. then they switched to another club in the league and they just thought oh the standards would be the same and they weren't and and mm -hmm. what a sort of eye opener that was we're like wait people are showing up late or people are like leaving training or whatever like this would never fly at home so even within the highest of high performance in the EPL, you have a whole other level of high performance and expectations at the top, top, top level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think the, um, sometimes we, you know, we talked about resources earlier and uh, you love to have them, but sometimes they're a crutch. Uh, I think you, mm. you can, you can buy some success at times, but, what it masks is whether you you really have created the sustainability that's necessary yeah. through your processes, through your culture, and and through the legacy that you'll leave. Leadership is great while you have a great leader, but are you spending time understanding why that great leader had such a positive impact on an organization? Yeah. Can you can you blueprint it in a way that it becomes a part of the club's way of operating? And now the success sustainable success of that club is not dependent on a person 
anymore. Mm-hmm. It's dependent on a on a culture and, and a way of doing things. And uh, you know, David was David was a born leader, and yeah. I learned a lot in those moments because I was young and I and I'll be honest, I I couldn't have had a better person in charge when I was there because he was really patient with me. Um, mm-hmm. I learned a lot about I learned a lot about emotional intelligence in my, in my time there, just, um, knowing that you have to become far more humble and far more, um, thoughtful in the way you, you Mm. looked at circumstances and the way you came up with solutions. And, uh, at times when I was rash, uh, you know, he was, he was good at not, at not coming down on me as hard as he could have for decisions that I made that were poor decisions. And he was, he was, could you give an example of one? Cause I'm like, I think David Moyes is a fascinating guy and has been incredibly successful in, in so many environments. And so I'm Mm -hmm. always fascinated, especially with this idea of, you know, you have the manager, the high profile person who gets all the blame and oftentimes, you know, not enough of the credit, but then you as a support staff, person for him how did that relationship work so like do you have an example of a time where maybe you messed up and he could have come down in a way and he didn't and it allowed you to grow and be better at what you do yeah and it more would come down to my approach uh it would come down to the the my the method i used to approach him or the situation my early in my career i, I you know i've always operated off of you know this high level of conviction and um, we're data oriented people. At least I was as a practitioner, sports scientist, performance coach. And when you're trying to navigate all the information that's coming into us, as it relates to what the player is ready for, what the player isn't ready for, uh, what might be a great decision today, what might not be a great decision today. The circumstances I'm talking about is when I was, when I was, face to face or in those meetings where decisions were being made and I was digging my heels in on, on certain, uh, on, on certain situations, professing my position as the truth. Mm. And even further than that, prophesying what the results were going to be. I just realized (laughs) that I I understand, you know, you got to understand that your role is to communicate what you know, communicate what you feel and and leave that in the room in a way where people can make great decisions on their own. You know, those individuals, it's their job. It's their job to make that final decision. I didn't respect that process enough hmm. er, early on. And, uh, you know, he could have, and he did. It, I, I got kicked out of a few meetings <laughs> and, I, and I think it was right. And it was rightfully so. Yeah, yeah, and there yeah. Was, there was days where it was clear that I was worried about something that never happened. And some of that is just the experience, you know, his, he had so much experience at that point. And then other times he listened, you know, and mm-hmm. he, at the time he was like, listen, Steve, like, just give me a second, man, mm-hmm. you know, let me take this all in. And then even though I left frustrated and thinking, Oh my gosh, like, I just don't think this is the right decision. Then I'd go out in the field and I'd see that he did modify things and it was more just me not giving anybody a chance early in my career. If you didn't say yes to what it was uh, that 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 my data was showing, I was so frustrated mm. in in those early early well, days. I think and that's, that's so, where I was great. Yeah, sorry, Ziggy did that too. I had Ziggy Schmidt. My, he was my first yeah Columbus head coach yeah, yeah. in the professional world, and and he did the same thing. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there was there, that that mentorship was was very very similar. And I'm well, there, grateful that getting to the Premier League, it was David Moyes and not somebody else. Not someone else. And that's so interesting because, right, there's the the science, which is your like, here's the data, here's what it says, unemotional, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the art or the feeling of it of like, I feel like we got a little more. And then there's the reality of, you know, but we have to win this game to not get relegated. We have to win this game to make it to Europe. Um so I need to push the envelope on this player or this thing because he's a, a difference maker for us. And that's, mm-hmm. that's the sort of, that's why the coach gets the, the manager gets the big bucks, right. Of like, because if that blows up and he sits a guy and we lose, 
that's all on him. It's not going back mm-hmm. to, oh, well, the high performance guy said he couldn't play today. So that right. that's the thing. And then there's that sort of gut feeling. And, and I mean, how much would the player get input as well of like, you know, because sometimes the data says this and you feel terrible. And sometimes the data says this and you're like, no, nah, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah, I, I think it there's it, it lands on a spectrum. Uh, yeah. You know, there's there's times when because the data is saying one thing, it's not totally conclusive. It's giving us a hint yeah. that there might be some risk here. Um, you know, you want to introduce it, you want to communicate it and make sure that everybody is aware that there's the possibility uh, of a risk here. But if it's not super clear, I I I like to trust my players, you know. Yeah. And and I think working with Greg Berhalter as long as I did, I saw him really intelligently always be in the position where, when we were including the player in the decision, it was because it was a moment of uncertainty that required the player's input. And a lot of times we would trust them in those situations. And say, hey man, this is what we're seeing. What are you feeling? And they say, listen, to be honest, I feel great. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it depended on the age of the player. Sometimes, you know, we, we wouldn't necessarily go as far, um, as, as the, as, you know, as far as inclusively with one person versus another person, just because of their age and experience. Yeah. And there's other times where you're landing on a different side of the spectrum where Mm -hmm. it's, it's very clear to me. Um, now maybe I'm 15 years of experience into this process, of seeing it over and over again, our data is getting better, our our intuitions getting better, and at this point, it's more going to the player and saying, "Hey, um, this is what I think is the right thing to do." Mm-hmm. Um, I I'd be total. I totally understand if, if this is a little bit frustrating, but um, my feeling is I need to hold you out today. You know, yeah. and what I tend to do, uh, and this was something I learned at Everton, was I would much rather come to the manager in a position where I'm trying to limit training so they can play matches yeah. rather than not pay real attention to what's happening training wise. And then all of a sudden I'm stuck having to limit their minutes in matches. I, yeah. I would rather be in a position where we're, we're doing everything we can to make the player available mm-hmm. uh, for, for games. For selection. Yeah. And yeah. For sure. That, and that's true. Yeah. And I think a lot of the times um, most, most, folks in my position are probably trying to do that. And, and yeah. in those situations, the players is, is grateful for it. Yeah. So it, you, you then go and you work with Greg again with the 2022 men's world cup team going to Qatar. Um, how's it different working with a national team where right at Everton, Columbus, Colorado, wherever, like you're there every day. Right. And so it's this, and now you're bringing in, 24, 30 players to camp who are all at a different cycle of periodization of load. Some haven't played any games. They are stuck on the bench. Some have played a lot of games. And so you have to manage, you know, 26 different (laughs) scenarios and then say to Greg, okay, this is what we can do in training today. Um, in in a short window, right? We're in a, we're recording this in an international window. Players played Sunday. They fly in from all over the world Monday. They're playing tonight. It's Thursday. They play in the weekend. They hit the road. You know. Yeah, it's totally different. It was night and day. Um, it was night and day because you have to accept that your role is different. Yeah. Uh, we we go from being individuals that drive athletic development to individuals that support athletic mm-hmm. development. Mm-hmm. Um, we drive high performance in one position. We support and promote high performance in the other position. And that's what we acknowledged very, very quickly. You know, we put together a really, really talented team within the high performance department in our four years, you know, that four year cycle that we had together. And collectively as a group, sports scientists, performance coaches, athletic trainers, physical therapists, nutritionists, we quickly sat down and said, let's define what our vision is, what, what we need to do every day um, in our mission. And what are, you know, what are the values that are going to be important for us to make great decisions, you know, week in, week out, as it relates to what our new role is. International right. soccer is so much different. And what we came up with was that we were going to support and promote high performance in North American soccer. That was mm-hmm. our vision. Mm-hmm. And as we started to come to grips with what that new role is for us, all of a sudden it was more important for us to be collaborators, facilitators, mm-hmm. 
rather than practitioners mm -hmm. and and uh you know and the, the our roles became more about planning supporting you know rather than training and coaching mm -hmm. when they were with us you talk about decisions on a very short turnaround now it was about we're going to live and die by the by the by the trust clubs have in sharing information with us. Yeah, that's an interesting one. It, it live and die by it. And yeah. at this point, people will share with you if they trust you. Yeah. And that's that's not just in our world, that's in in the world of sport. That's anywhere. That yeah. that's that's a, a truth you can live by. So that's what we said early on. What do we need to do to create high levels of trust? And which we didn't have coming in. Uh, the previous cycles before us uh for whatever reason, we were in some unstable positions with with clubs around the world, just about whether they trusted us or not. So we had to do a lot of work, and that was the goal. Right. If we get into a position where people around the world care about the U.S. winning just as much as we do, then right. we've done our job. And that's really what we set out to do. And in, aren't in you the also saying to them, like, listen, we care about this person, so he's coming here, but we also – our job is to deliver him in the best physical shape back to you. So he doesn't miss anything with you either. It's this combination of, of things, right. And you've got players, Christian Pulisic, who went through, you know, a bunch of injuries, especially muscular injuries that mm -hmm. is harder to manage versus, you know, someone who breaks a bone on a tackle or whatever, um, you know, and then people who just, you know, never seem to be hurt. They manage it. Uh, you know, a guy like Tim Ream, who's, you know, in his mid thirties and just can show up and play. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, not, not by mm -hmm. accident. I'm not saying that at all, but yeah, that mm -hmm. trust is so important. Like, and I think it's really interesting because there's has to be trust from Greg down to all the support staff. And then there's got to be trust from the U S staff to all these different clubs around the world. I mean, this, mm -hmm. what, what is, what, how do you, grow the trust? How do you make deposits in that trust bank? That's a great question. You know, since I've left, since I've left the national team, I, I can't, I think I've done, I'm about to do my fourth keynote in April and all of them have been in around collaboration because that mm. was really the centerpiece of our success as a high performance department. And the whole thing is like, how do you get people to collaborate? Yeah. You know, the, and, and, what I'll say is the it's the risk of collaboration that makes people apprehensive because in a collaboration, I have to accept the fact that the outcome isn't totally under my control. Mm -hmm. So many parties are integrated into a collaborative decision that my decision to share is directly related to how comfortable I am with the vulnerability of sharing. Yeah. So you, you, when you talk about trust and creating trust, you have to decrease the feelings of vulnerability. Yeah. You have to make risk more beneficial. Mm. A lot of times you can look at risk at two different ways and you can either look at it as the fear of what you have to lose, or you can look at it as the optimism of what you might gain. Mm -hmm. Either way, it, it's a perception and that perception needs to be changed when you're entering these collaborative relationships. So what we decided was, that if we're going to ask people to be vulnerable, we're going to be vulnerable first. Mm -hmm. Because sharing information means if anything happens to Christian Pulisic, Yunus Musa, and I shared information that shows it was my fault, what mm -hmm. are they going to do with it? Yeah. Vice versa. Right? Yeah. So what we did was Jordan Webb and Darcy Norman and everyone else involved started you know, collaborating around building platforms that shared all of our information with the clubs mm. without restrictions. Mm. That was us taking the step first. We said, Hey, is that, is that rare on the national team level? Very much so. Very yeah. much so. Um, I can't speak to whether we were the first, but what can I, what I can speak to is clubs in our circle continued to reinforce the decision we made by telling us how grateful they were Mm -hmm. for the way in which we approach the collaborative process. Mm -hmm. The other key ingredient is common ground. Mm -hmm. You know, co collaboration is a lot easier when you can feel common ground. And mm -hmm. when you talk about the player itself, something as simple as saying, we are a player centric department. Mm -hmm. We are a player centric high performance platform, which means 
first and foremost, in any given situation, we will put the well-being of the player first. Mm -hmm. That was our position. Mm -hmm. My conversations with Greg, it was very, very clear. I'm not going to recommend something that's U.S. men's national team first. It's always going to be player first. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to try to fit it on that spectrum of can I please both without putting the player at risk? If I can Mm -hmm. do that, that's our goal, 100%. -hmm. And who makes that final decision? Greg, you, the player himself? Three of it's you a together? combination, yeah, but in yeah. the end, I'd I'd like to think that um, it's it's not really one person. It's just common sense that right. makes the decision. Right. Because you know, Greg is a different breed too. Mm-hmm. Uh, easily the best working relationship I've ever had in my career. Mm-hmm. But it was because of the way we had conversations. It was mm-hmm. because of the way we ended on decisions. And and I'll I'll be honest with you. There's things about my job that he he just said. Listen. What do you think we should do? And nine times out of 10, whatever came out of my mouth is what we did. Cause he, mm-hmm. he appreciated the way we approached our mm-hmm. jobs as a department. And he knew I was just communicating the opinion of a team. This mm-hmm. was not Steve's opinion. Yeah. I was communicating the way in which we came to decisions collectively. Yeah. And the times when it wasn't, it was kind of out of my hands was super, super rare. Mm-hmm. But what I'd say is Greg was always, always true to the player. You know, mm-hmm. we needed to win. And there was times he said, what's the risk here? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was our job to give him the percentages of risk versus reward. And yeah. if it was leaning towards something that was out of our control and and didn't necessarily give us a feeling that we could predict it, it just wasn't worth it. What we also did is early on when it didn't matter, you know, we really did lean towards keeping the player safe as possible. Mm-hmm. And we want to trust like I, the amount of times we created a platform where clubs could see our plan for the player before they even arrived in camp. Right. And right. if they ever had an issue where they said, Hey, I'm looking at, we overlaid their data with our data so that we yeah. could see spikes in, you know, acute yeah. chronic loading where there was an issue, but we allowed the clubs to see where those spikes were. Right. Now we're we're super open to vulnerability. Yeah. Like if we if we see that there's a spike there and we didn't yeah. adjust for the spike and the player got hurt, the club can go. What were you doing? Yeah, and it's now so, more more accountability of the club to give you good data, right? Give like, us good data, hundred like, percent. Because they we're know not, we're, gonna we're lose giving it. you the wrong thing and someone gets hurt. Well, yeah. we didn't actually give you what was correct, and so this guy yeah. got hurt yeah. because you're working and, with the wrong that's information. Exactly right. And yeah. practitioners would tell us, like I, you know, just knowing the player over the last you know, eight weeks, I see this spot. I'm a little bit worried about this spot in camp. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was a match day Yeah. and they would tell us like, I think if you play in more than 60 minutes, like we're, we're crossing into an area where we can't really predict what's going to happen. Yeah. And Greg, even in games that mattered, Mm -hmm. Greg was excellent at looking at those situations and, and finding great ways to keep our players healthy, but also benefit from knowing that, you know, we we had a better chance of winning with with them on the field and we we made adjustments and the clubs were so appreciative mm-hmm. of the way in which their information over here made its way to me here then to greg here mm-hmm. and it was as if they were speaking directly to greg yeah. and that's that's why things work so well and then what happened and this is the the part that leads us to the world cup is yeah. then once we got to the world cup we could leverage that trust. Yeah. We could leverage it. And now they knew I need to make USMNT tilting decisions. Yeah. And every single one of them said, Hey, you guys have done a great job. We trust you go win games. Yeah. Go win games, you know? And, and we got to a point where when we needed them to back away and let us make decisions, not interfere and trust us, there was there, we had zero issues. And for and those John, who aren't... I had text messages from people after, yeah. you know, from practitioners around the world. Yeah. After qualifying matches, after World Cup matches, it's three or four in the morning where they are. Yeah. During some of some of these games, I'm getting texts congratulating us. There's there was practitioners that I got text messages from in France, congratulating me on a victory that we had in El Salvador in Central America. Yeah. And they're all the way in Europe. Yeah. They stayed up to watch the match. Yeah. You know, I think that's really impactful stuff that says that they cared about us winning. 
you know, they, they want their player to be healthy. Don't get me wrong, but they cared about us winning. And that that's a testament to how we approached collaboration and the sensitivity that we looked at it and, and, and the decision to be vulnerable first was a big part of that. Yeah. And I mean, I think what's interesting as well, the sort of two things pop into my head. Num- number one is, you know, for those who aren't soccer or football people listening to this, this was a unique World Cup in that you really only had a week before the World Cup. People were coming right from their club yeah. seasons versus the usual couple of weeks or month or whatever it has been with summer World Cup. So it was yeah. very, very unique sort of time. Um, because then you had to hand them back right in the middle of their season as well. So it wasn't like they got a break afterwards and stuff. And then but number two, what interests me is as you're balancing these things, how do you not affect the player's mentality? Because you don't want a player going in thinking, man, if I play more than 60 minutes, I might get hurt. And then they're holding back or whatever. And so like, how do you navigate those communications um, so that come game time, people are feeling I am fit, I am ready, and I'm at my very best. Yeah. Uh, one, you're you're correct. Like, this was a very very challenging World Cup based on the the way in which it sat in the in the calendar year. Uh, it made it it made it pretty challenging, um, not just with clubs, your you know players that were playing in Europe, but. U.S. based clubs where we knew there's a possibility of some of these players making the World Cup roster who didn't make the playoffs, which means they're done. No more competitive yeah, soccer yeah. as of October. Yeah. And we need to keep them fit for six weeks before the World Cup starts. So there's a lot of challenges to that. I think as it relates to the player, confidence comes from hearing that people are talking about you. If mm. I'm a if I'm a player, you know, the mm. uh the number of times that the player heard us say and repeat what their performance coaches at their club had said uh, and vice versa gave them a feeling of like, I'm, I'm just, I'm walking a tightrope, but the net below me is, is secure. Like I know that I'm, I'm safe. These, these folks, there's nothing that the two sides don't know. And the environment shares so often that the the players feel super confident of us pushing right up to that line, mm-hmm. right up to the line of risk versus reward. Um, we could be, we could be aggressive with that because we included the player in the conversation and before they arrive, they were already hearing about how collaboratively we were working with their clubs to, to make sure they were in a good spot. You know, we were, we were in a really unique position that even if a player was in, in return to play protocols or, um, you know, whatever it might be in terms of a rehab process, clubs included us in mm-hmm. the decision-making process, not just based on diagnosis and, Hey, what do you think of, of the timeline on this, but week by week, uh, you mm-hmm. know, we're, we're thinking about hitting this particular milestone. What do you think? And um, Ron Chenault, who was our head athletic trainer during that cycle was so in the loop as it related to rehab, um, and it and it allowed us to have a seat at the table, which is n- which is not normal. Mm. But it also allowed us to have players in camp that at any other given situation, the club could have used that little niggle to say, "Hey, you're not going." Right. But they, you know, we we the number of times we had players in camp at the end stage of return to play, right. which is a really sensitive, risky time where you're still. You still have to take the player through, um, you know, uh, different type of milestone testing to determine their availability. They right. allowed those players to come into camp and do that testing with us instead of keeping yeah. them for another week, which they could have by by FIFA regulations. They didn't well, have to. Well, let these well, as come in. as we're like having this conversation, right? You know, Tyler Adams is in with the U.S. Mm-hmm. right now after. Yeah, six months out or whatever it is, right? Bournemouth paid a lot of money for him. He really hasn't played mm-hmm. all season. He just played mm-hmm. 15 minutes and now he's in camp to play with the US. They kind yeah. of probably easily said, you're not going, but they, you know, I think this trust that Greg built and you guys did is allowed to say, okay, they're going to manage him well and he needs minutes, right? He needs, you know, he doesn't need a two week break right now either. He needs to start getting minutes. So let's go get him those minutes. But Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. they also have to trust like, hey, you're not throwing him in 90 times two or 120 times two because can't do that. 
it, you know, the number of times we had that situation and we're trusted with it. I can't, I can't count on my fingers and toes. Mm -hmm. And that was a real testament to the work that was done collectively, not just in our department, but you know, Across if we were doing great work and nobody's listening in, from the technical side, yeah. we wouldn't have gained the trust that we gained. It was about the collective process of going from information gathering to the decision-making process off of that data, off of that sharing. That was eventually the responsibility of the technical staff. That continuum is the reason why we had so much trust. At mm. any point in that continuum, if we break, yeah, then we lose trust and there's no way we leverage any of it in that process. Tyler's a good example. Yeah. There was periods in qualifying where, you know, Tyler was dealing with back stuff and mm -hmm. or he might have been dealing with, you know, soft tissue muscle stuff. And he was allowed to come in camp. But we mm -hmm. also told them, listen, he's not going to play until this date. Mm -hmm. Our plan is to rehab rehabilitate him for this right. number of days. This is what we're going to do over those days. And then this very first game. We're going to introduce him into the game. These are the minutes we'll play him, but we need to play him 90 minutes against Mexico in the Nations League. because mm -hmm. And that's the way it went in that particular window for the Nations League that year. Tyler yeah. came into that window and he wasn't ready, uh, yeah. but they allowed him to come into camp. There's no way. There's the, I, I, I remember numerous times at Everton when we'd have players that we knew what they had was probably only a 10-day thing, seven-day thing. But we just didn't trust people and mm -hmm. we because they didn't give us the reason to trust them. And, and we use the rules to say, listen, you're staying here. We're going to look after you here. Mm -hmm. We would do that for the because it was better for the player because mm -hmm. we didn't have a level of trust in those situations. And I'm on the flip side of it. And I couldn't I couldn't I was so grateful that we had done the work we had done to be in a position that allowed others to trust us that much. And then, you know, we dealt with that pressure. Well, there was a lot of pressure in those circumstances to make great decisions, to not mm -hmm. violate that trust. Mm -hmm. And we just had an exceptional group of practitioners and uh, it, it showed in the way that we approached not only the, the world cup in general, but the whole four years leading up to it. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in that world cup, we've talked a lot about trust amongst support staff to the coach and to the other clubs trust within the group and in the team right and so here you are an observer and you know i'm not sharing anything that isn't very public with geo Reina and sort of like a young guy who sort of loses the trust of his teammates by his behavior or his actions in in a time like that um you've talked so much about collaboration and alignment well one player out of alignment um can really destroy the culture of a group. One executive in a business can destroy the culture of a group. And so how did you see the leadership of the US team in that moment, you know, shift Rainier's attitude in while he was in Qatar? Because as everyone knows, it was pretty close to being sent home. This was a this was a tough circumstance. Yeah. The the what I'll speak to is the in incredible consistency of the leadership not only of staff but of the of the leadership group within the, the player roster right um you know the, the what what doesn't get communicated enough is how much everybody cares about geo yeah i think that's the most important thing that came out of it was players were in a position where they saw uh themselves in geo because of his age, but they also understood the pressure that that young man is under. Yeah. Um, there, there it, it's, it's not easy to be a, a young American player in Europe. Um, it's not easy to be a young player in general in Europe, but it's, it's especially difficult for young mm -hmm. American players. Mm -hmm. And, when you combine the pressures of being a young American player, uh, playing at a club like Dortmund, and then taking that pressure and, and uh, amplifying it with the, the world stage of a World Cup, I was super impressed at the way in which the group supported Gio. And mm -hmm. some of that support came from really direct conversations. 
uh, tough uh, love. Like, uh, because I love you, because I care about you, I want you to uphold the standard of the group, right? I'm not yeah, going and to I want you to excel. And, and I want, I want you and to be want your you best. To be successful. Right, because that'll help us be successful. successful. Right. Correct, correct. And that's the hallmark of Greg Berhalter. And yeah. we're, we're talking about Geo now, but what I'll tell you about Greg is he's the king of second chances. Yeah. He, he's the king of third chances, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I've, I've witnessed it over and over again at the club level and the national team level. And even if we're excluding Geo from the conversation, there's more than just Geo in terms of the examples of not only what Greg believes as a leader, but what U.S. soccer embodied and the men's team embodied through our time there. Mm. Second chances are, are paramount in the stability and the, the viability of our culture in the way yeah. we approached what success looked like. Uh, and that's, that's probably the headline that should yeah. come out of the whole situation of the world cup was mm -hmm. people should be very, very proud of a young group of American kids. You know, uh, this was yet, you know, technically we were the second youngest team at the world cup, but by yeah. days, John, yeah. like yeah. for all intents and purposes, we were the youngest team at the world cup. Mm -hmm. And that group showed an incredible maturity uh, that that the the country should be proud of, and, and the way the way they took care of Geo is a part of that. Mm -hmm. But I would even challenge you to go back and, and check out Tyler Adams' press conference before the game against Iran, mm -hmm. where there was some real controversy over whether the U.S. was being respectful of different cult, you know cultural pieces, heritage pieces that related to the circumstances in and around Iran at the time. Yeah. That press conference was one where right before Tyler goes on, he's informed that this is going to be a contentious press conference. Mm -hmm. And he has asked some very, very difficult questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you should, I mean, I came out of that. I couldn't believe the, the intelligence, thoughtfulness, awareness, and worldly understanding that that kid had. And he's 24 he at the time. Yeah. At yeah. the time he was. Yeah. And, and, and I, yeah. I will say that that he was a shining example of probably what our whole group represents, mm -hmm. which is in a, you know, a total, you know, um, it's an, it's an America that we can be proud of. Yeah. And I was happy to see that that particular group of players uh, could easily be held up as an example to the whole world uh, of what America can be. And mm -hmm. I was incredibly proud of, of that player group. And when they yeah. came out of it, yeah, uh, he was, he was a shining light and that team should be, should be given the, the credit they deserve for representing yeah. our country in an incredible way. That's awesome. All right. Yeah. So post world cup now you've, you've now, you moved away from U.S. soccer, but, you know, you supported Matt Fitzpatrick for the 2023 PGA Championship, U.S. Open. What's the difference between, and so working with a golfer, an individual <laughs> sport and a, and a team yeah, sport? Yeah. Um, it's because it's different, but there's a lot of things that are the same. Team still matters. Team still matters. And the, 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 um, the characteristics that define high performers, uh, is relevant in any environment, whether it's the corporate environment, performing arts or sport, you know, you, you consistently want to put people in a place where their routine and their rhythm produces success. Um, you know, Matt's, Matt's a, an incredible, an incredible human. Uh, I, I, I really do admire the way he approaches his sport, but I appreciate the way in which he, you know, he, he really refines his craft. Mm-hmm. Um, anyone that's watched full swing in the first or the second season can see just the analytical uh, process that he has and that he desires to use as it relates to how he, you know, uh, evaluates his game and the way he, you know, refines his game. Uh, anybody that's kept track of every shot they've hit in practice or in rounds since they were, you know, 13 years old deserves admiration. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of journals. Uh, he's, 
Yeah, he's an incredibly analytical kid. From my, from my perspective, the biggest difference was just the amount of difference you can make when you're applying all of your efforts into one person mm. rather than it being distributed across, mm. you know, the attention of 26 athletes. That was um that was a lot of fun. You know, when you're when you're really just being able to put all your attention into one person, um it's just it changes what you can accomplish um, right. in a short period of time. And and with with him like are you managing all the other coaches? Like I'm not quite clear on your role, but like you know, because no, no, there's because uh, yeah. there's right a putting short game coach, and there's a swing coach, and yes. there's a nutritionist, and there's a overall coach, and strength and conditioning. Like, what was your role in that? Yeah, yeah, and and to be and to add another wrinkle into it, I was filling in. Oh yeah, okay. For his primary for his primary caregiver, who was who needed some time away so that he could welcome you know the the birth of a, of a new child and, and be with his family in this period where, right. you know, he needed to be present. He needed to be home. So yeah. the other piece of it is balancing that their program already exists. Right. So how do I live in this space and really support, um, support his success, support the foundation of what was, was built, you know, by others. And then, you know, in a respectful way, communicate what I'm seeing and what could possibly be, you know, beneficial additions to the process. Mm -hmm. But I really was there focused on, on his needs as a sports medicine and sports performance practitioner. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I needed to collaborate with his swing coach. I needed okay. to collaborate with, with, you know, individuals that were planning his practice weeks and things of that nature. But again, I was filling in. So a lot of it was about balancing it all and being respectful of the process, process that existed before I got there. But my my focus was very much in and around his physical well-being. And probably better than, you know, the version of you 20 years ago who looked at the data and said, no, you know, versus now you're yeah. like, okay, I know <laughs> right. how to, you know, like, uh, okay, like this, how can I, how can I make sure he doesn't do anything to hurt himself, you know, right. but maybe you won't be exactly what I would do but it's really not my place in this moment. And that's that humility uh, as in, in vulnerability as well to be like, okay, you guys, you're all doing pretty well already. So let mm -hmm. me not mess it up. Yeah. When I got there, he was eighth in the world. So it's yeah. not like, you know, that there was a, a lot that needed to be adjusted, but my time with the national team helped me. Like there was, it was the same thing. I was, you know, I was borrowing a player and I had to return them in the mm -hmm. best physical condition I could, you know, uh, and it, it was very similar. So just understanding the, that the roles were supportive in nature, facilitating in nature, um, collaborate, you know, collaboration in nature rather than I wasn't driving things. I wasn't in a position um, to really be augmenting. It was it was more about just having a really good understanding of all the moving pieces. Yeah. And when I stepped in to execute my role, Am I in a position where I'm helping him excel and I'm returning him to his team? Yeah. In the same or even better, if I could, physical condition than he was when I arrived. It was it was some of the skills that I acquired from being in the national team definitely helped me. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, la yeah. last little bit here. Um, you know, because when I reached out or you know, we, we sort of what are some topics you want to talk about? One of the topics you put down was fighting group think and lead organizations and teams. And and yeah. so I think this is a really interesting place to end on because it's very easy to have some success and then have this great outcome bias and say, well, why would I change? I've done it this way for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Or we've now surrounded ourselves with people who all think like us and don't challenge us and don't challenge the way we think about things. Um, and it's a very dangerous thing. So talk about that for a second, because I think it's super mm. important. Yeah. You know, th this one's, a, this one's, I probably, I cross this a lot, uh, not just in sport, but uh, in, in different environments where, um, a lot of times it's because success ends up getting misinterpreted as um as a predictor of future outcomes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that becomes really really difficult. Uh you know, just ask Nokia, right? Like yeah. <laughs> you go from having a 60% market share at one point in your in your in your existence as a company to, you know, whatever you know, single digits that ended up in uh, when that whole 
uh, when that whole thing collapsed. So what what I generally see that becomes an issue is um, the way in which I can enter into a lot of organizations and just kind of throw a blanket over them. You know, there mm-hmm. um, there's not a whole lot different. I saw this in a lot of in my role with the national team. You know, you're you're experiencing what's happening at a lot of different clubs because we have to communicate and collaborate with so many globally. Um, you know, you get a really clear picture of what people are doing as it relates to data and analytics. What are they doing in, in relationship to, to you know, performance uh, performance programming? What are they doing in terms of load monitoring, you know, return to play, so on and so forth? And there's a lot of this is what we do because that's what everybody does. Right. Type of processes taking place. Um, that that creates some massive blind spots mm-hmm. in the one thing that makes performance and success sustainable is process. And um, we, we live in a world where systems are complex. Mm -hmm. The, the way in which we have to, to get to a W means that we are dealing with organizational complexity. And in my world, it was physiological complexity. When you have complexity, a lot of times you don't find weaknesses until the system is placed under pressure. Mm-hmm. So when the system deals with stress, it breaks at its weakest points. But complexity, complex systems hide those things really well mm-hmm. because of the nature of what complexity does, especially in human physiology. So for us, it was really about understanding that processes are how we get around our blind spots. Processes are how we get how we how we define ourselves and how we respond when we do have failures. Mm-hmm. When there is a failure, we refine that process. We make it better so that the mm-hmm. same mistake doesn't happen again. That's the point where groupthink kills organizations. When I touch on groupthink with folks, it's not because what I'm saying is that in general, um, we should be able to identify weaknesses see them, correct them in every given circumstance. Instead, what happens is I want to draw organizations to the moments in which their group think hurts them. And Mm -hmm. normally it's in and around these moments where there's an opportunity to take ownership and accountability for something, or there's the opportunity to blame it on something else and push Mm -hmm. the blame away from ourselves so that we don't have to change So we Mm -hmm. don't have to do the work to move towards a different process because that requires work. It requires us putting our hand up and Mm -hmm. being in a position to take blame. And this is, you know, this is a a consequence of cognitive bias, which exists everywhere. You know, dissonance is cognitive dissonance destroys organizations. And Mm -hmm. this is where groupthink is a killer. Mm -hmm. At any given moment, I can look at failure and I can do one of two things. I can either I can either fill the gap between you know I think I'm a great practitioner and I've just gone through an injury crisis I can mm-hmm. fill that gap with all kinds of cognitive bias so mm-hmm. that I can continue to believe I'm a fantastic practitioner yeah yeah justify my the, existence or my exactly. actions yeah the space in between is the dissonance yeah this is where groupthink kills us it's yeah. in this space between what I feel about myself, what I feel about my organization and the reality of the circumstance I'm in. Because the reality of the circumstance I'm in is challenging the way I feel about myself or the way Mm -hmm. I feel about my organization. Mm -hmm. At that point, an organization needs to know whether they're existing and operating within groupthink. And it's an awareness of it. And at that point, if I have the opportunity to refine process, groups that Groups that understand their blind spots will be able to steer. Mm-hmm. They'll be in a position to be agile. Um, you know, there's, uh, if you've ever read the book, um, uh, oh man, Trouble in Paradise mm-hmm. by Rasmus Ankerson. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, uh, sorry, Hunger in Paradise by Rasmus Hunger, Ankerson. Yeah. He, this is what he touches on. You know, he basically talks about the way in which our success blinds us to the fact that we're, you know, 
you know, the king has no clothes on. I mm -hmm. think that's that's really what we're talking about as we relate to groupthink. Mm -hmm. If we're in a position where our starting point in the values of our organization is that we're accountable and we take ownership mm -hmm. and that the end result of our ownership is refinement of process, mm -hmm. then we're going to develop a resiliency to groupthink. No, right. We'll be all right. Right. We'll be and, okay. Yeah. And that's the like, right. In this moment, we either have a moment for growth or a moment to justify our existence. And the mm -hmm. truly great organizations, practitioners, coaches, and athletes say what's good about this for, from a growth perspective versus getting all defensive about it. Right. And because you might have been, yeah. you might have been right. <clears throat> like it doesn't mean you made the wrong decisions, but there's still, something in it that'll allow you to grow if if you're open mm -hmm. to it. And mm -hmm. I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, in this podcast of all the um, coaches we've had on here, I mean, legends like Phil Jackson or Steve mm -hmm. Kerr, or Tony DeChico or Anson or Tara Vanderveer, I mean, top in, mm -hmm. in multiple sports, they're all curious. Mm -hmm. They're all curious. Yeah. At the end of every conversation, we stop the video. They're like, what are you reading these days? Any recommendations? Yeah. Or, hey, you mentioned that. Can you send me that link or whatever? I want to check that out. Like there's this yeah. curiosity. And then the level below is this sort of ego driven. I know it all. I can't show any vulnerability at all. That's exactly right. Like one of the most impactful books I've ever read was, was Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me by mm -hmm. Carol Tavris. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What a, what a book, man. What a book. Mm -hmm. And uh, my my colleague Darcy Norman, who I work with with the national team, is the one that drew my attention to it. And again, this is an example of the the or the culture that we had. We were not a group think culture. Like Darcy pulls me aside and says, "I got to talk to you about something you need to work on." Mm. Yeah, <laughs> like what a what a valuable thing to have yeah. as a leader, but also to have just within an organization. He's like, "Listen, your strength is your conviction, mm. but your weakness is your conviction." You yeah. know. And he ended up, he's saying, listen, I, because I know you can go to another level, like you need to read this book, man. And he yeah. was right. Like I just had this, I had a, a, a just a, a thin, I had this thin line, this thin line in me that just would lean back on some cognitive bias at times. And because we're in a world where you got to make decisions fast mm -hmm. and the, the pressure and um, the pressure of what that of the outcome of that decision means it better be the right decision right away. Well, that mm -hmm. that lends itself to somebody who has conviction. Mm -hmm. But in the end, if you if you if you really lean into conviction in all circumstances, you'll start to just move on what you've convinced yourself is fact, mm -hmm. rather than just sit back and go, "Where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Let's just evaluate my bias that's contributing to this." And yeah, yeah, man, I had to hold on to the nightstand reading that book. Like it, it really <laughs> did it hit me hard. And he was, he was right. Like there's so many things that came out of me reading that book Yeah, that gave me the ability to understand my own, you know, periods where I had my level of group think in me where I was just like, I'm all right. You know, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm yeah. all right. And but you had, you, I mean, you, you had created an environment where he felt safe to say that to you. And that's what they talk about psychological safety. Like I can speak up, yeah. I can say that. And I'm right. saying this to you because I care about you, <clears throat> right? Yeah, that this correct. will make you better, right? And there's a lot of environments yeah. where people don't feel safe. And the, or if the leader is not open to it, or maybe the leader would be open, but they haven't created an environment where people are, you know, not afraid to speak up. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in, in most most circumstances, um, I can't think of a situation where the success that an organization like that has is going to be temporary. Yeah. Like it, 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 it's not sustainable, right? Yeah. And we know this world changes fast, regardless of what industry you're in. Yeah. And if you're not in a position to be open and receptive to when you need to steer and when you need to let somebody else take the wheel, I, yeah, you're going to struggle in, in mm -hmm. most circumstances as it relates to, uh, you know, any environment where you're trying to achieve high performance. Yeah. Amen. Well, Steve, this was a wonderful conversation. We covered tons of ground. Um, I want to give you the last word if you want, and then also how can people best connect with your work? Uh, ElevationProxProx.com is the website, but any other ways that you would prefer people to reach out or follow your work, um, anything would be great. That's the best way. Um, you know, I try to be, uh, I try to be just active enough on LinkedIn to where, you know, uh, people will at least 
at least know what kind of trouble I'm getting into. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great, that's a great spot to do it. Those two spots are probably the best, you know, my website and, um, and LinkedIn would be a great way. And I try to respond pretty quickly, uh, you know, especially if I'm messaged, uh, through LinkedIn, um, you know, I've learned, I've learned some great stuff from people, you know, people that reach out to me that I've never met before. And, you know, you end up creating friendships that you never thought would happen. So the, those are the, yeah. those are the two spots to definitely utilize if, well, if you I, feel like I, I can bring some I say, value yeah. to your situation. Yeah. And I say, I, I tell people LinkedIn as well. Like that seems to be the one platform left full of reasonable people who actually <laughs> want to learn something or whatever. So hopefully it stays Fair that, enough. that way. Steve, thank right. you so much for being on the way champions podcast. We truly appreciate it. this was a wonderful conversation. Yeah, I'll return that to you. Thanks for just the interest of bringing me on. And uh, I hope we can maybe do it again, man. This was great. Really appreciate it, John. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you to Steve Tastian. Again, the website is elevationprox.com. A wonderful conversation and insight into high-performing environments, what makes them work, what makes them fall apart. And I loved all this conversation around trust and collaboration and second chances and, and so much more. Um, and, and just learning and growth and curiosity and what the best leaders bring to the table. So connect with Steve there. Also just look him up by his name on LinkedIn as well. He said, that's a great place to connect with him as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you to our friends at Sprocket Sports for sponsoring the podcast. Thank you to our uh, podcast champions on Patreon. Just go to Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com and um, you, uh, forward slash way of champions. And that's the best place to um, connect with us there. Again, thanks to Marlo, Marlo Lil, L I L E, uh, for becoming a new member. Uh, we truly appreciate you, Marlo, and uh, helping us out and supporting the podcast. All right. Um, and just, yeah, Way of Champions Conference um, coming up August 9th, 10th, and 11th in Denver, Colorado. Live stream option, uh, in-person option, which is always the most fun and the best. Uh, we have our hotel blocks already set, and you can register now and save $100. Just go to changingthegameproject.com right at the top menu, Way of Champions Conference, okay? Remember, everyone, your influence is never neutral. So go out there, change the world, make a difference this week, and we'll see you again next week.